Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj was one of the greatest sages of the 20th century, an Advaitin master, a master of non-dualism, and truly a great jnani. Jnani means someone who has embodied the Brahma jnana, the ultimate knowledge of Brahman. And a lot of people are familiar with his work through his great book, I Am That, which is a very popular book within especially Advaita Vedanta circles. And it can be a bit of a tough read for those who are not well versed in non-dual knowledge, especially from the Advaita Vedanta perspective. But it is an extremely important book for one to dive deeper into their spiritual practice and their understanding of the non-dual reality. And there are many, many quotes within I Am That that I could refer to. And I may refer to many uh, in further videos. But this one in particular that I'm going to speak about today is very important for us to understand because a lot of people get confused about particularly the idea of a guru or a jnani within India and about this idea of Brahma jnana, of the knowledge of Brahman, how we embody that what we would call in generic terms enlightenment. And so in the book, he was asked by someone the difference between Brahman and a jnani, because this not only in the West is confusing, but can be confusing also in India, where these teachings originate from. And if you're not well versed, as I said, with this sort of knowledge and certain words in Sanskrit, then it will be confusing for you going forward because you will have this idea that the jnani or the guru thinks that they're God in air quotes. But that's not entirely true. And we have to also get rid of that word God. Now, in this quote, you'll find that they use the word God, they use the word him. Now, this is the result of an understanding in English, these translations. So you need to replace the word God with Brahman, the ultimate reality, when I say the word God here in this upcoming quote, remember it means Brahman. And also when it is said him in reference to God, we could replace that with it, even though it is probably insufficient to describe Brahman itself. So without further ado, let me dive into this quote for you. God is the all doer. The jnani is a non-doer. God himself does not say, I am doing all. To him things happen by their own nature. To the jnani all is done by God. He sees no difference between God and nature. Both God and the jnani know themselves to be the immovable center of the movable, the eternal witness of the transient. The center is a point of void and the witness a point of pure awareness. They know themselves to be as nothing. Therefore, nothing can resist them. Straight away in this quote, you see the idea that's reinforced in non-dual schools of who is the doer of actions and the thinker of thoughts. Is it truly me as a jiva, as a persona, as an ego, or is it actually just Brahman itself? What we find in certain schools like Shaivism is that the idea is to continually downregulate your ego so your personal will becomes Shiva's will. Now that may sound interesting and, and difficult, but what happens when you get the doer of actions and a thinker of thoughts out of the way, then Brahman can use you. Or in Taoist terms, the Tao can use you. We often hear that in Taoism as well, once we remove ourselves out of the way. Now, a jnani, the one who has the knowledge of Brahman, who has embodied it, then becomes a non-doer because it is only the jiva who thinks that it can do anything and can achieve results and so forth and so on. And so once that jiva is out of the way or down, completely downregulated, then Brahman's will becomes your will. Now using the word will is not sufficient enough either. The energy of Brahman, we should say. But using will can appease us if you're not too analytical about everything that's being said. I know a lot of people can be a little bit analytical and dissect things too much, but it's to get you into that idea that energy moving through you is actually not your energy once you have embodied the ultimate knowledge and you have become enlightened, so to speak. And so Brahman is the all-doer, but that's also not as accurate as what 
you may think because Brahman itself, as we see in the next line, Brahman does not say, I am doing all. So Brahman follows the way of nature. The energy of life is following the way of the universe. Brahman, Tao, call it what you will. And life happens of its own nature. Now in Chinese, there's a word called Zitran. Zitran means spontaneity of itself. Now Zitran is a naturalness that gives rise to another component in Taoism called Li, which means organic pattern. Now everyone has their own personal organic pattern, their own nature, so to speak. Now in Chinese, you can translate Li as the markings in jade and the grain of wood, the fiber and muscle. And for a human, that is on a psychological level. So that's why some of us have a certain aptitude for certain things and others don't. But we can only find that a lot of the time once the jiva is moved out of the way. So the naturalness of the Tao, of Brahman, can move through you to use you as it needs to use you. Now, obviously, the, the debate would be, well, why should I be used like this? Again, that's the jiva questioning and doubting the experience that you are living. If we look at the Bhagavad Gita, right, even Krishna is trying to assure Arjuna that he needs to fulfill his duty as a warrior and go to war. Now, that story is intentionally designed like that to, in some sense, shock you that even a warrior themselves need to go to war. And Arjuna had to fight his own cousins. Now, it's designed like that to get your head around that your life has a certain way. And no matter if it's a warrior or a craftsman, once the jiva is out of the way, that's what the universe is requiring of you. So that's why for the jnani, all things are done by Brahman, not yourself. So essentially, Shiva's will becomes your will, or Shiva's energy becomes your energy. So the jnani doesn't make this artificial difference in between Brahman and nature itself because it's all non-dual, it's a non-dual reality. Now we could say in some sense that the natural world is Saguna Brahman, is Brahman with qualities. And if we look at it from the yogic perspective, nature is Prakriti. Nature is physical, mental, energetic. It's everything that makes this life that you and I are experiencing. But Purusha, is the pure awareness that witnesses all of it. Now, the Atman is the same. The Atman, the undifferentiated consciousness within you that is identical with Brahman, witnesses everything as well, but witnesses it as one with itself. Now, this is a very Taoist idea too, because Taoism are trying to reinforce into your mind that you are part of nature and you are part of this process of nature evolving. There is no difference between you and nature itself. That's an artificial boundary. That is like making an artificial boundary between God and nature, which some religions do, and that contributes to disastrous results because people's way of thinking then, unfortunately, is geared towards that nature is there to serve us and we can use it however we feel. Now, in the Eastern traditions, that is definitely not the case. Even if we look at the original name of Hinduism, Sanatana Dharma, that translated into English is the eternal natural way. Now, so once we've got rid of the jiva, then we can understand this non-dual one reality that we are all a part of. Because the jiva is, is somewhat an interference pattern. It is a socialization process we've all gone through, which contributes to us not seeing reality as it truly is. This is what maya is. Maya means the measurement of reality. That's what the illusion is. The measurement of reality of this and that. And so when you're dissecting the world up into this and that, then you can't see the true one nature of reality. You are only seeing reality according to the belief systems and the socialization that your jiva has been indoctrinated with. So you essentially see the world through rose-colored glasses. Once you take those glasses off, then you start to see the reality as it truly is. And after those glasses are taken off, as Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj says, then both the jnani and Brahman themselves reside in the immovable center and can witness the movable, the transient, the changeful, because they are abiding in the changeless. 
Now, there's a similar idea in Buddhism where we see the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra. Now, the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra is the ultimate witness of reality, where the Buddha is touching the earth. And the idea behind this image is that no matter what life brings, the Buddha resides in that immovable center and is not blown here or there by the winds of change. He is firmly grounded in the immovable eternal center of the universe. And so as the eternal witness, you can see life as it is, just a moving process of nature. And your mind then will not be involved nor attracted to get engaged in anything that the world is trying to pull you into. Now, does that mean you won't go about your day and do your daily things? Of course, that's not what it means. But it means, as I said before, you will not be the doer of actions. You will move through life effortlessly where the jiva has been moved out of the way and you will fulfill your role, but it won't be in the sense that you get any sort of sense of fulfillment from it, if you know what I mean. You won't attach to accomplishments or desires. They will have all dissolved where you can just move effortlessly with life as life and there's no problem there. Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj says an interesting thing where he says that when we are in the immovable center, it is kind of like a void and that's where the witness of pure awareness resides. So the concept here is that pure awareness itself is a nothingness which is hard for us to grasp. It's hard for us to grasp because our ordinary state of mind does not usually reside in nothingness for too long and doesn't understand how sort of nothing can come from everything. In Taoism, they have this concept of uchi, which is Tao in stillness. And Tao in stillness, uchi, gives rise to tai chi, which is Tao in motion, which then gives rise to yin and yang, which are the polarities or the mutual opposites of the entire universe. And so Nisargadatta Maharaja's point here is that the Jnani and Brahman reside in this center, this void, or what we would call a void from our puny intellects. And the Jnani embodies this witnessing pure awareness. But the point here is that because the Jnani embodies this, they know they are not something. They know they are actually nothing now, nothing here means nothing in this world. It's not an object of knowledge. You essentially are not an object of knowledge. And that's part of the great saying in the Upanishads where the knower of Brahman does not know the Brahman. The one who does not know the Brahman knows the Brahman. Now, the point of that phrase and what I'm getting at here is that once you have an object of knowledge within your mind, you miss the point. You've made it a something. And that's what the great Jnani does. They reside in that witnessing pure awareness. And in that state of consciousness, they are no thing. And from that state of consciousness, everything is shanti. Everything is peaceful. Everything is calm. Nothing can disturb you from that state of consciousness. And as Nisigadatta Maharaj says, therefore nothing can resist them. And that's why a Jnani has a lot of power, right? If we look at the great Jnanis of the 20th century, if we, particularly if we look at Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj and Sri Ramana Maharshi, there was a gravitational pull that people couldn't resist. They had to go to meet the master because there is an energy there that is undeniable. And even if you go to some of these locations where both of these great Advaitin masters had lived, there's still an energy there today. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. And so that is briefly why in the non-dualist traditions, we have the jnani or the guru. And in some sense, they are respected and appreciated. And as students, we ought to practice deference towards them because they have done the work to downregulate their jiva, to deliver that ultimate knowledge that we know as Brahma Jnana. Shanti, shanti, shanti.